you know that I am a person who loves to travel. And in my younger years, I was blessed to have had several opportunities to do so. While I also enjoy traveling, though, I also very much enjoy being at home. And nowhere am I most at home in my house than when I am in my kitchen. I love to cook and to bake. There is great joy for me in creating flavor profiles and in the act of hospitality in preparing something for my family and loved ones to enjoy. It's where my creative juices flow and it's sheer pleasure for me. One thing that traveling taught me at that young age was how very wasteful we can be with food in our country and how millions of people in other parts of the world would give their eye teeth for the easy access to nutrients that we enjoy without a second thought. And so after encountering hungry people around the world and also close to home, I returned home and vowed not to contribute to the 30% of the food supply in this country that goes into the garbage, which is a terrifying number if we stop and think about it. But instead I would use any morsel of food I would purchase in every way possible. So not throwing away food has become a spiritual discipline and almost a game for me. Our Halloween jack-lanterns turn into Thanksgiving pumpkin pie, and the gooey insides become snacks of toasted pumpkin seeds with the kids' school lunches. This approach to cooking involves a lot of careful meal planning and grocery shopping, so as not to buy more than what we need, but to buy enough. All right. I can't pretend to be perfect at this, but I've worked at it, and it's yielded some pretty creative dishes you wouldn't find in any cookbook anywhere. And in going about my meal planning in this way, I learned the lesson that any good cook knows. The leftovers always taste better. <laughs> right? They always taste better than the original meal does. Leftover rice originally made for a stir fry on Tuesday might find itself recreated into a yummy cheesy casserole on Friday. The remnants are then thrown into the crockpot soup for Sunday's dinner. They somehow take all of these flavors and blend them together into something even better than they were before. It's almost as though they needed that extra time to combine and figure out how to work best together in order to become more delicious. Today is Transgender Remembrance Sunday. This is a day when we remember that our God, our Creator God, creates such beautiful, people and such beautiful things in this world and we as a gathered body are called to learn from one another to grow together to honor each flavor so that we can come together to do something even more amazing so i was musing about all of these things and about the reuse of ingredients this week as i did my post thanksgiving meal planning and i was also pondering this as i looked at our text for this morning Jesus has been brought before Pilate because the chief priests and scribes know that he is a threat. He needs to be taken care of before things get out of hand. It would appear by all accounts that like ours today, Jesus' turkey or goose was cooked. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? In the other three gospels, this story occurs in all four, but in the other three, Jesus responds with a very simple, almost resigned, it is as you say, or you say so. But not so here in John. Jesus still has some fight left in him here. He responds to Pilate with a question <clears throat> instead. Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? More questions back and forth, and then the crux of the matter as Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my disciples and I would be fighting right now. But my kingdom is not from here. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Christ the King Sunday, or Reign of Christ Sunday, as it is sometimes called, is this Sunday as well. We're combining a lot of different flavors this week, in case you couldn't tell. This is an odd Sunday, liturgically speaking. Much like our leftover turkey, 
It's sandwiched between two really good chunks. It's the last Sunday of six months of ordinary time, hence the green. And it helps us lean into the thematically juicy Advent season as we prepare for Jesus's arrival into the world. We typically wear white on Christ the King Sunday, but it is the end of the green season of ordinary time. And it's just before the blue or the purple season of Advent, a real mixture of colors and flavors. So I'm representing all of these on my stole today. Feel free to take a look at this closer. We have purple and green and white. They're sort of blue-ish tints. All this mixture of colors, all of the seasons, it's fitting in this text. Because we see a mixing of and a confusion of expectations around what Pilate is addressing. What does it mean that Jesus is called a king? Jesus is talking about his kingdom, and of course everyone misunderstands him, nearly everyone, and thinks that he intends to overthrow Rome. But Jesus has another idea in mind, and he stirs the pot, so to speak, by professing that his kingdom is not here. Instead, he is testifying to the presence of a kingdom, the foretaste of which is here, but the greater meal of which is yet to come. This is the mixing that is happening. It's almost a muddling of what had previously been separate, easier flavors of understanding of the kingdoms on earth and of God's kingdom somewhere else. There is a real bifurcation in this time, in Jesus's time, of what those two things were. And oftentimes we see that false dichotomy here in our world as well. On this Sunday, we're savoring leftover liturgical soup. It combines these two understandings. And as we know, the leftovers are always better than the original dish. Jesus has come, and everyone thinks that this is it. He is going to do great things in Rome. Surely this is the moment, the coming of a new earthly kingdom, with him as an earthly king. But Jesus says, no. He defies expectations and promises that what they're experiencing right now is just an appetizer. In a way, Jesus is the great original dish, but the best, he says, is yet to come. How is this possible? Almost as though the flavors need that extra time to combine, figure out how to work best together in order to become even more delicious. Jesus' kingdom, this already but not yet kingdom that he is talking about, this was a new message, a new mixture, a new dish with flavors that are familiar, but then are combined to create something new, a dish unlike any the disciples had ever tasted. For Jesus as king models something extraordinary and unlike anything they've seen in a king before. Rather than lording untold power over his plebeian humans, this king chooses to come down and live among them. This is like the fables of kings who decide to become paupers for a day, right? Just to see what it feels like. This is the coming of a king as a tiny baby into the world. Jesus did this for an entire lifetime, though, and not just pauper for a day. He is a king choosing not to be the greatest, but rather to be the least. Choosing not upward mobility, but downward mobility, in order to remind us of the real kingdom to which we belong. It's a topsy-turvy kingdom where the flavors become not simpler, but more complex, and expectations change as the world as we know it turns upside down. The kingdom of the God is a kingdom of love where getting ahead actually nets us very little. It is a kingdom in which the first shall be last, the last shall be first. It is a kingdom where the king becomes the pauper so that all paupers become children and heirs of the heavenly king. Whereas we will hear in a few weeks, a God chooses not the lofty throne from which to command, but instead the lowly manger from which to cry. 
It's a kingdom that comes to earth in Jesus who embodied this message of radical, all-inclusive love. So the world rejected Jesus and this kingdom. His message baffled his followers. It terrified his adversaries. For while it didn't intend to overthrow Rome, it did intend to overthrow people's hearts, which is even more scary at times. Far too radical for its day, the flavors were far too complex. This is like the first time I had my two-year-old try something spicy. Spit it right out. Now he loves it, though. Take some time. But if we're honest, the original dish of Jesus' message still threatens to overpower our palates today. For who among us actively seeks out living life in this way? If we were kings or queens, would we give it up so that we could just know our subjects better? Who among us actively seeks out the less well-paying job in order to find a better fit for one's spirit? Do we dare to seek out something good and try to make something even better with it? Or do we cling to what is good in our lives and not seek to change it because we know what it is and we like it? Do we dare to take a good turkey dinner and risk making an even, an even tastier meal out of it? If we are relatively content in our lives, what do we do when we feel the inner Holy Spirit urge to try something else? How easy is it to ignore that voice and to just continue on with what we know works. Jesus said that he came to testify to the truth of the world, but this isn't head truth that he's talking about. This is the more complex truth, rather than just believing in the kingdom to come. God up there, us down here, separate flavors, easy to pick out. This is the truth that comes out of nowhere, that is that gut-level inner understanding that God resides within us, and consequently, we have a role to play in bringing about that kingdom now. This is a complex dish, intuited by only the most advanced of chefs, but accessible for all to savor. So often when faced with that deep gut level understanding though, it scares us because it is jarring and new and we respond as Pilate did. After a few verses, or sorry, a few verses after our reading for today, we're told that Pilate believes Jesus to be innocent and he actually tries to release him. I find no case against him, Pilate repeats to the crowds. But Pilate was faced with the threat of downward mobility and the choice he is faced with terrifies him for just as he tries to release Jesus, He's reminded by the crowds that there would be hell to pay with Rome if he did so. His classic question to Jesus, what is truth, is a question that reverberates down the centuries to us today as Jesus encourages us to face these truths. That black and white head level truths, someone was born looking like this, and now they are choosing to find their identity in themselves in a different way than we know them to be. Gut level truths about ourselves and about who we are in the world. In the end, despite the gut level truth that Pilate knows, he succumbs to the fear of what his kingdom would look like if he releases Jesus. His life would not be as easy. So he hands him over to be killed. And he contributes to throwing away the greatest of news the greatest of dishes the world has ever known. And this is hardly the end of the story. For as any good cook is able to do, God can use even this most bitter of turns, even the biggest mistakes in the kitchen, the failure of Pilate, the killing of Jesus, the throwing away of the greatest dish ever, in order to create something that is even better than that, the resurrection, which is a foretaste of the heavenly kingdom or death will have no power at all. And what is the new dish that God creates? What new richness, what new complexities of flavor come? It's almost as though those flavors needed some extra time, centuries even, to combine and figure out how to work best together in order to become even more delicious. 
This is the good news for us today. For God takes all of us, every bit of us, our current leftovers, the little containers tucked away in the fridges of our souls, seemingly useless, disconnected scraps of being, and make something even better out of them, something even more extraordinary, in order to carry the truth of Jesus' message into this world. God tells the truth in the leftovers. And strangely enough, we are a part of that dish waiting to be added to the glorious table that God has in mind, spread open for the entire world to gather and partake of. Children of God, even if you prefer takeout, even if pressure cookers still scare the daylights out of you, that's fine. Even if you can't fry an egg to save your life, may we all lean into our calls as cooks, eager to play with what God has given us, even if it seems like it's only scraps, even if it means stirring the pot a little. May we do our best to show the truth of God's love in this world by being brave, by taking risks with the leftovers of our lives, so that they can become part of the main meal that God wishes to dish out to this world, a glorious feast of love fit for kings and paupers alike, all equally welcome in the kingdom of God. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.